Hello and welcome everyone to the Center for Functional Medicine Grand Rounds. My name is Elizabeth Bradley and I'm the medical director for the center um, at the Cleveland Clinic. And I'm a pleasure to introduce Grand Rounds speaker, Dr. David Thurman. But before we get started, please note that questions will be taken at the end of our program. Please put your questions in the chat function and we will ask them. Also, this program is CMB accredited and the course code will be provided at the end of the program. So, Dr. Furman obtained his doctoral degree in immunology from the School of Medicine, University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, for his work on cancer immune surveillance. During his postdoctoral training, he joined Professor Mark M. Davis at Stanford School of Medicine, where he focused on the application of advanced analytics to study the aging of the immune system in humans and decipher how cumulative inflammatory responses associated with aging lead to an accelerated cardiovascular aging. Dr. Furman then moved to the University of Bordeaux in France, where he studied the involvement of the endocrine and immune systems in human aging and in kidney transplantation, and helped create the systems biology department at the Sidra Medical Center in Doha, Qatar, before joining as a principal investigator for the National Scientific and Research Council in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Furman was back to Stanford to take the senior role as senior scientist at the Institute for Immunity, transplantation and infection. And his work involved the use of high bandwidth, high throughput technologies to measure immune function and machine learning tools to better control in cardiovascular aging. At present, he's a director of Stanford's 1000 Immunomes Project for the Center for AI and Data Science of H at the Bucks Institute for Research on Aging and an adjunct investigator for the National Scientific and Research Council. He has published dozens of scientific articles in top tier journals such as Cell, Nature Medicine, GNAS, and The Lancet and others. And today we are honored to have him present Hallmarks of Aging, The Immune System Takes the Lead. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Furman. And thank you for having uh, me, uh, Liz. Uh, it's really a pleasure to to give this seminar to uh, such a um, selected uh, audience, and, um, and and thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm going to start sh uh, sharing my screen, um, and obviously, uh, when I when I say the immune system uh, takes the lead, um, I'm a little biased. Uh, but but I'm going to demonstrate that uh, uh, with some slides here that I, I hope to convince you that's the case. Um, um, as, as, as Liz uh, mentioned, Dr. Bradley, uh, um, I'm director of the Thousand Immunomes Project. I'm going to walk you through some of the research we've been doing at Stanford over the past five to uh, seven years, I would say, and recently took a position at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. Um, leading a new AI platform there to understand how aging um, occurs and what can we do about it, um, especially looking at the immune system. Um, some disclosures, uh, I am a founder and chief science officer of Edifice Health. Um, this, um, uh, I'm going to mention some of those uh, disclosures and uh, what we're doing in terms of the application of the new metric we have based on the stuff for 1000 immunomes. Um, I'm not sure what, why is this going through so quickly. Um, I think it's just uh, by default. Um, but anyway, that there's uh, some important accreditation and disclaimer here. Um, I also wanted to mention very quickly the objectives of this uh, presentation, explain why AI and machine learning are ideal tools to study the human immune system, how the immune system inflammation define healthy versus unhealthy aging. Um, there's something uh, going on with the slides. I apologize for that. And um, two um, other objectives are to describe major differences between acute and systemic chronic inflammation and why multimorbidity is today a primary priority for healthcare research. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to just walk you through some slides to really uh, convey the message that the immune system is really uh, a major determinant of, of health. 
So this uh, is a picture that came in a 2013 paper, Nine Hallmarks of Editing. Probably all of you have read this paper or know a little bit about this research. Uh, we know that there is gen genomic instability, telomere attrition, um, epigenetic alterations, and all sorts of things here going on in the human biology, uh, mostly um, studies in, in, in animal models, but still uh, there's something missing. And I'm pretty sure you at this point understand what's missing. Um, and that is systemic chronic inflammation. So I'm gonna show you a study that we did looking at very simple um, metrics, right? We're looking at the number of papers that have been published in the aging space related to the different uh, hallmarks of aging. So altered intracellular communication and aging, the number of peer-reviewed uh, published articles in the y-axis and the years from 2010 to 20, uh, tw uh, 20 uh, 22, or expected 2020 this year, last year. So here you have cellular senescence. Uh, it's it's kind of uh, you know, ramping up. And then you have mitochondrial dysfunction also, but look at the inflammation. This is by far the association with aging that tells us that there's something going on in the research community where we're looking at the um, different effects of the immune system and inflammation on, on, on aging. So by far, we know that the number of publications that have been associating uh, aging and, and different biological processes um, are now uh, mo mostly uh, uh, geared towards the immune system. And here the p-values comparisons for all this. We are beating uh, every single hallmark of aging. So that should look more like this, where systemic chronic inflammation is not just one additional hallmark of aging, but actually causing many of these uh, different hallmarks of aging to occur. And there are some publications there to, there to, to, to link this idea. Um, and we published uh, a paper 2019 just pushing this idea forward that chronic inflammation is not just important for aging, but across the lifespan. We see that in, in young adolescents, we see that even in, in, uh, in uh, young kids with type 2 diabetes and so on. Um, so I just wanted to uh, stress the idea that um, we are using systems biology, systems immunology, and why is that? because um, on the one hand, we have hard sciences here, and they, they're very good at mechanistic explanations of, of, of different processes, right? And on the other hand, you have these soft sciences that are more correlative, like psychology, so, so sociology, and political sciences. And these all are part of uh, human culture and human uh, health. We're all trying to tackle um, um, wellness and, 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 and well-being and, and health. Um, the one thing that I noticed, and you can clearly see from this plot, is that the level of control we have in these experiments with physics or chemistry is pretty high, but the complexity of the models is tiny. Right? We can't explain too much. Here, the complexity uh, is much more uh, increased, uh, but the level of control is very, very small. So we have a lot of confounding factors when you look at sociology, psychology, and even uh, close to medicine. Um, so there is a solution to that. And we think systems biology is the solution. And it, it really um, contains all these different scopes. Uh, this is not new. Um, Berta Lanfi in the early uh, 40s uh, came up with this idea that uh, a biological system is an open system. So there are inputs and outputs and everything that moves in here will move also somewhere else. Very simple idea. But that really uh, triggered a whole body of uh, sciences that we call uh, complexity sciences um, that uh, evolve alongside with cybernetics. And you can see we're here, data sciences. This is what we're doing today, right? This is what I teach and, um, at the Buck Institute and Stanford and elsewhere, um, where we can take uh, different aspects and elements of biology, but also data science 
and uh, AI machine learning um, and all those fancy terms for what it is advanced statistics really. So the systems theory of aging was uh, coined or put forward by, by Tom Kirkwood and Claudia Franceschi in early 2000. They said that we have to study systems uh, using systems biology. Um, and this is a nice cartoon to explain why this is good uh, or well suited for study the human immune system. If you focus on this uh, very simple, let's say CD4 T cells or your favorite molecule that's a chemokine or, or cytokine, you won't see the whole picture. You may be a very good um, scientist in understanding that particular cell type, but you're missing the these states. So in this multidimensional immune state, uh, that is formed by molecules and and um, and, and cells uh, interacting with one another, uh, and this formation of states are may very well be driven by the age of a per person or a certain infection. And so, if you don't understand this, it's very uh, difficult to draw conclusions and have biomarkers and interventions. So we said in early two thousand uh, and eight and seven, uh, thirteen years ago, let's reinvent the wheel. And, and why is that? Because today you go to a doctor, many of you are um, healthcare providers, and I ask my doc, how's my immune system doing today? They won't have an answer, right? The uh, best thing that you can do is maybe uh, give me a, 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 a CBC. And that's a very outdated technology, but we still use it. Um, it doesn't tell you really about the function of your immune system. Uh, but luckily we can pick up um, blood from humans in a very simple way and use that to learn about our immune system. And that's what we did at Stanford. We said, okay, let's set up a whole human immune monitoring center uh, inspired by the Thousand Genomes Project, where we're going to be um, gathering all these fancy uh, data sets and uh, um, big data using a technological center and bioinformatics, we're gonna be using AI and machine learning, and with the right immunological expertise, we'll, we're gonna be able to derive new models and hopefully new therapeutics of aging. Um, that was the vision. Um, and it was quite successful. Over 13 years we've been doing this, uh, the thousand immunomes was born. And <clears throat> we've been publishing a number of papers um, based on this data set. We uh, had um, over $30 million from NIH funding and also uh, Larry Ellison helped us build this, um, this center. And the study ran from 2008 to 2017. We're getting another 15 uh, million pretty soon from NIH to continue this study for the next five years. And these are all the data uh, types that we collected in, in, in the different individuals. So we get gene expression, proteomics, phenomics, cell enumeration by Cytoff, um, over hundreds of cells that you can look into in blood and so on and so forth. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring up uh, this, this very obvious um, observation that not all people respond equally, right? Um, and that's very clear for COVID, that's very clear for uh, other SARS viruses, the flu, and so on. Some people get, um, get infected, um, some people are asymptomatic, some people succumb from disease, right? So we're using humans because that gives us large variation. And that's exactly what we want. We don't want small variation. We don't want animal models that at the end, you cannot translate into human research. We want humans, we start using humans. And I love the idea of having variation because you can learn, you can subset groups, you can stratify patients, you can embrace that variation. So it's not a curse, it's actually a blessing. Um, we demonstrated that over and over, and what I'm showing you in this slide is just simply the response to the flu vaccine, good responders in black, uh, poor responders in um, uh, white, and for the most part, we know that the elderly don't respond well to vaccines, um, but we ask the question, why is that? So based on the Stanford Thousand Immunomes data set, we were able to predict who's going to respond to a vaccine prior to uh, the administration um, of the vaccine. So what are the features that are selected here? We get 84% uh, accuracy. Uh, don't pay much attention into this uh, lambda um, uh, tunable parameter. It's just to say that as we are increasing um, uh, 
uh, uh, model complexity, we have a sweet spot where we get about 84% accuracy in our prediction. This is cross-validated area under the curve. And age is obviously the major um, predictor. This uh, is a negative predictor. So the higher the age, the lower the responses. But you have other features. And uh, one of the features are um, um, uh, apoptosis related features. We remove age from the model. The accuracy goes down, but more features are selected. Um, and this is just to stress the idea that by doing uh, machine learning, machine learning over hundreds of features, you can discover uh, important uh, determinants of um, vaccine responses in humans. So we're using humans for the most part. Um, so the other uh, piece of information I wanted to convey here is that there's been some studies showing at sh showing that a CMV cytomegalovirus may drive immunosenescence. So the uh, lack of, of responses in the elderly and the drop in CD8 naive cells and increase in CD8, uh, CD8 effector memory cells and all sorts of things that happen with age in your immune system. Um, and this is one observation, right? And this is what we see in our data. So in CMV negative young people, the fraction of um, terminally differentiated CD8 T cells is pretty low. In CMV young uh, positive people, it's, it's uh, um, close to 20%. So this is very dramatic. Um, but there's here a double whammy, right? We have the effect of CMV and the effect of aging. Um, so we could say, oh, CMV, um, you know, um, accelerates immunological aging. So let's look at the, the more in detail what's going on in other parts of the immune system. So what we did is try to disentangle this uh, whole problem here and try to uh, predict these different classes, who's uh, CMV positive, who's CMV negative, and I'm doing this just to simply demonstrate that we can select features that are absolutely different in one case and the other. So here I'm showing you the features that are associated with CMV in a dark gray. So for the most part, you, you see an upregulation of uh, different things like gamma interferon and um, NKT cells and some gene modules and some signaling nodes. And for the most part, you see a decrease in the aging uh, phenotype. So for example, a drop in naive, CT, uh, uh, naive CDA T cells, uh, uh, a drop in these different responses to um, uh, cytokine stimulations in different signaling nodes. So things don't look the same. So we have been looking at, um, a, in a very unbiased fashion, the effect of CMV and aging. And uh, we discovered that actually CMV does not accelerate immune aging, but rather potentiates the immune system. As, look, uh, as you can see from this slide, this is the responses to the flu vaccine in CMV negatives and positives. This is in year one, in year two validation cohort. So we see that um, in the younger population, not in the elderly, CMV positivity is actually associated with a good outcome. Um, and we demonstrated that that's mediated by gamma interferon and so on. Another application of our um, pipeline is multimorbidity, right? Um, and why is this? Because in the aging space, multimorbidity has become a top priority. Um, there's, um, I'm sorry. Um, okay, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Life happens. Um, so multimorbidity in the aging space is top priority. Uh, the reason is there's a lot of cost associated with this. Um, and why is that? The, Complications of multimorbidity are associated with coordination of medical care, management of polypharmacy. We have a large uh, program on understanding why polypharmacy or how polypharmacy would affect the immune system, the time spent per patient, and the aggravation of one condition uh, by symptoms um, of another. And, and in total, the annual cost in the US is $3.5 trillion. Um, 
I don't have to tell you that inflammation is important. I already mentioned that. Many, many studies have shown uh, that inflammation is driving many of these diseases of aging. We publish in cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disorders. We have a, a big a brain aging study, immunosenescence, um, depression. I have a paper we published in 2014 in molecular psychiatry, um, and so on and so forth. Um, interestingly, this uh, condition starts in the womb. Um, but there's also the effect of the exposome, right, that we're going to discuss in a moment. Um, very important, uh, this is something I want to stress uh, for, for the community here, um, acute inflammation, which is what you probably have heard of for the most part, is absolutely different than systemic chronic inflammation. Uh, first of all, in the case of acute inflammation, this is caused by infections or damps, right? It's short term, you should get rid of the trigger by two, three, five, maybe seven days, and then things will heal. And uh, there are very well established biomarkers, IL-6, GNF-alpha, CRP, all these are markers for acute inflammation. Please don't use those markers when you try to associate things with uh, systemic chronic inflammation because um, there are a number of studies now that show that these markers are not showing up in age-associated uh, systemic chronic inflammation. In this case, um, in the case of, of age-related systemic chronic inflammation, there's been no canonical biomarkers. And so uh, one, you know, uh, widely used um, biomarkers is CRP. Um, there's a couple patents and papers published by Ricker where you can clearly see that the area of the curve prediction of different um, cardiovascular disease uh, or events is, is relatively low, right? Uh, a little bit better than random, uh, and yet it's the only thing that we have in the clinic. Um, so I'm going to just uh, briefly talk about a paper we published in 2017, a nature medicine paper looking at IL-1 beta. It's the only one that uh, is kind of an overlapping feature between sterile inflammation and infectious disease, uh, uh, infection-driven um, inflammation. Uh, these are a number of modules of gene modules that we discover in our cohorts are upregulated with aging. So this means that uh, everything outside of this dash line would be associated with aging, okay? And, and in blue, you see genes or gene modules that are downregulated, and in um, red, you see upregulation of the genes, okay? So this is simply to um, illustrate that there are inflammasome-related genes, and these are the inflammasome is, is a molecular scaffold that uh, that takes care of the maturation of IL-1 beta and IL-18. Uh, so major um, pyrogens, if you have those in high levels, you're not going to do well. Um, and the two uh, uh, inflammasome gene modules that we focus on here, 17, uh, module 78 and 62, are enriched significantly enriched for inflammasome genes. So we look at several years of data, and overall you see that there's an upregulation in these gene modules um, in different years from 2008 to 2012. Um, this is um, a little bit uh, older of a figure now, but you can see that this is high in old, high in young, and for the most part you see an upregulation for both gene modules across the board. Right Now we said, okay, we see a tremendous variation here. Why not stratifying patients based on the chronic elevation of inflammasome gene modules or the persistent repression of these, taking the uh, top quartile and the lower quartile? And what we discovered is that um, people with high inflammatory uh, load, so people with um, the inflammasome high uh, um, expression module, are more prone to be in the hypertension uh, strata, and people will have also elevated palcrate velocity, so that's a, a marker for central stiffness. Um, and also, we demonstrated that people with high um, expression of inflammasome um, modules will have a uh, individuals in their family members that didn't make it to a 90. So 90 and older inflammasome module low are actually enriched. Uh, and we have some other data suggesting that we can predict disease um, uh, death. Uh, so you can see here that people that were still alive 
in uh, 2016, and as I said, this is longitudinal study of aging, um, had expression in 2008 of gene module uh, associated with inflammasome, very low compared to those who died during 2011 and, and 2016. This is a very important figure. And then on top of that, we see some uh, protein expression and so on in this different um, stratification of individuals. I'm going to skip through some of these slides because I, I have an, another uh, uh, story I want to tell you about uh, later in this presentation. So just like um, what we did before we go from discovery using this uh, pipeline to very specific demonstrations that our discovery are actually uh, mechanistically relevant. And what we did here is taking monocytes and all sorts of uh, immune cells and uh, stimulate them with the a number of metabolites that we discover using metabolomics. And these are here, adenine, adenosine, um, and for acetylcytidine and so on. And you can see that uh, the metabolites that were associated with aging in our cohort are actually uh, producing or are, are, are inducing production of IL-1 beta to a larger extent. Um, so we believe this gives a second signal for uh, IL-1 beta production based on the canonical way inflammasome works, so a little bit of a complicated story, but I'm just going to make it simple. We discover metabolites that are acting as damps, danger-associated molecular patterns in driving IL-1 beta production in monocytes from these older individuals. Um, we also demonstrated that caffeine intake uh, negatively reg regulates expression of these uh, different um, inflammasome genes, and in people with uh, the inflammasome module high group, had also circulating levels in ca caffeine and other caffeine uh, derivatives that are much lower than those with um, inflamm inflammasome module low. So in other words, um, um, the people with high levels of inflammasome are less, um, have less caffeine and caffeine derivatives in blood. This is to demonstrate how caffeine works in driving down inflammasome gene expression and so on and so forth. But let's go for a more unbiased uh, way to discover um, protein biomarkers associated with inflammation. We took our n-dimensional proteomics data and we created a deep neural network. And why a deep neural network? Why are we using nonlinear math? The reason being that the data is noisy, so uh, this usually takes care of the noise. Second, uh, there's a lot of redundancy. Proteins can do same, similar things, and that's normal, right? Evolutionarily speaking, you want to have redundancy in your immune system. Um, and, and there's nonlinearity, so minute changes can, uh, can signify uh, major uh, biological effects. So those three, um, uh, I would say, uh, characteristics of, of this uh, proteomics data uh, led us to think, let's use a nonlinear approximation to this. And this is the, the deep linear neural network. So we build an, a neural network to be able to predict the inflammatory age of a person. What is inflammatory age? It's simply the age of a person in the inflammatory space. Okay, so we're using all these uh, proteomics data to predict the age of a person. And we do that by using this uh, guided autoencoder. Um, don't pay attention too much to the to the math here, um, but um, to summarize this, we're using cytokines to create a hidden layer. This is uh, what's shown here. Uh, second hidden layer, um, what we call immune code, and these are just combination of cytokines in nonlinear uh, ways to create these uh, internal representations, compact representations of the data. And what we're trying to do here is to predict the original data, right? Reconstructed cytokines. It doesn't seem very intuitive, uh, but it is because if you take, let's say, the decoding uh, layer here or this one, and you're doing good at predicting uh, these these cytokines, you could do you could then use this compact representation to uh, predict other data sets and to uh, generalize outside of, of this one. 
But most importantly, what we did is to predict the age of the person. Okay, so in parallel, we are predicting cytokine um, data, and this is not just cytokines, immune proteins, cytokines, chemokines, growth factors fr circulating from serum, and we're predicting the age of a person. So we're doing quite well at predicting age, but that's not the important part. I might just you know, ask you for your ID. I, I don't care about uh, how good I'm doing at predicting age. Um, actually, I prefer to have a, 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 a poor prediction because I have a large variation. And the main question is, once you adjust for the calendar age, as shown here, is it the case that this person that has a high inflammatory age and, an, and, a, and a calendar age of 40 is at risk to develop multimorbidity, diseases of aging? Is this person at risk? Are these folks protected in the lower end of the spectrum, right? Um, in other words, is inflammatory age after adjusting for a calendar age predictive of disease phenotypes? And that's what we did next. Can we predict multimorbidity? Um, so what you see in this slide is the number of diseases in the uh, x-axis and age-adjusted inflammatory age in the y-axis. You can really nicely see that we are tracking a number of diseases and the conditions that went into the model are listed in the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disorders, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, what a mess. Um, and uh, what we did next then was to take a group of centenarians who are 100 years or older um, from a collaboration with the University of Bologna, and we demonstrated that on average, these centenarians are 40 years below their, uh, their calendar age and they're protected from disease phenotypes for the most part. Um, you can also see that there's a tremendous variation in centenarians of this inflammatory age uh, uh, index. So the index is simply the subtraction, inflammatory age minus calendar age. And you'll see the validation here is pretty close to zero. And the centenarians, you also see is even uh, uh, an interesting outlier who's 80 years below his calendar age. He's a 105-year-old uh, male who really never gets sick, um, super healthy person, and he looks like a 25-year-old uh, adult. So uh, there, there's a lot of variation. Definitely microbiome may play a role. Definitely genetics some, you know, may, may, may play a role, but, but inflammation is a biggie one here. Um, because we had the stimulations uh, done in uh, several immune cell subsets, looking at the JAK-STAT pathway. This is a, a pathway that takes care of viral infections and also um, tumor cells. Okay, so um, if we are defective in our JAK-STAT pathway, likely uh, we won't have a good response to tumors. Uh, we have a higher susceptibility to cancers and also to viral infections. What you see in this slide is across the board in the adaptive immune system, so B cells, CD4 C, uh, of different flavors and CD8, the stimulations of the responses uh, and the responses to, to those stimulations are all dampened in people with high inflammatory age. So this is a regression coefficient of a, a linear model where we have um, age, inflammatory age, BMI, and other confounders, and, and the outcome variable will be the uh, fold, fold increase in, in these different pathways. So you can see that uh, the higher the inflammatory age, the lower the immune function. So we can predict immune decline. This is this is a big deal, obviously, for COVID. And we don't really understand what, what's going on here in monocytes, but uh, it is very apparent that they are ready to shoot. In people with high inflammatory age, um, the adaptive immune system is dumped, is, is slow, and the, um, and, and the uh, innate immune system is kind of hyperactivated. We had a, um, another cohort of uh, super healthy Palo Altonians, we call them. Uh, we recruited 151 people, only 97 pass uh, selection criteria of being super healthy, uh, nine, uh, 25 to 90 years old, and um, they were normal for blood pressure, uh, very normal BMIs, close to some, some groups a little higher, but in general, uh, not significantly uh, different or uh, uh, borderline, but the, the, the older groups are actually uh, doing even better, uh, non-diabetic normal kidney function, and very low high sensitivity CRP. So look into this for a moment. We're matching people for CRP. 
That's a very important point. And now what you see here is just one example, which is the remodeling ratio of a series of phenotyping um, procedures that we did in the cardiovascular system of these 97 people, where you clearly see is that age plays a role in driving remodeling of the left ventriculum, also sterile arterial stiffness, but you can see that CXL9, which is a protein that is the major contributor to inflammatory age, is also positively uh, driving this uh, remodeling ratio of their left ventriculum um, after adjusting for pulse wave velocity. And you can see that LIF, another important measure for um, inflammatory age, is, is negatively correlated um, with, with uh, pulse wave velocity and also remodeling ratio. Um, so we can pick out accelerated cardiovascular aging phenotypes in the normal healthy population that are otherwise um, relative, you know, healthy and and uh, by, by any means. If you look at their uh, history of uh, uh, comorbidity, they don't have any. If you look at their lab measurements, they are all relatively uh, uh, healthy. So. This is the uh, another functional test for um, frailty, and this was done in people 75 years and older that we uh, derived their inflammatory age in 2010. That is the um, the the y-axis, the predicted uh, frailty score. And frailty score in, involves a time up and go, some other functional measurements, and also a large survey of autonomy. This is a modified uh, frailty index uh, from Rockwood. And what you can clearly see here is that in 2017, this is uh, in the y-axis, I apologize for not uh, labeling this correctly, uh, and this was measured, the functional uh, frailty score in 2017 and we predicted the frailty score in 2010 using inflammatory age, we can do a pretty good job of predicting frailty seven years before it happens. Now, um, let's, took another, let's take another uh, view of, of this inflammatory age metric. We now use gene expression from whole blood to predict inflammatory age. Why are we doing this? Because that's the only way we can really extrapolate to external data sets, right? We know that uh, gene expression omnibus and Array Express have uh, probably uh, millions of samples of gene expression. We also had the uh, Framingham uh, heart study data. And so we created an inflammatory age in the gene expression space, what we call GEIH, and we can predict all cause mortality. Um, using the uh, Framingham start, uh, heart, heart study. And this is after adjusting for all these different covariates, age, gender, and risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And these are the genes that are being picked up by, by the model. Um, this is in 2,300 people, and this is uh, now accepted in Nature Aging as a paper, um, which will come out, I'm assuming, in the next couple of weeks. So let's deconstruct the inflammatory age to see what are the major biomarkers that you may be interested in, in, in looking here. So CXCL9 is the major one. This is the Jacobian, so the first partial derivative of inflammatory age. Uh, trail is important. Gamma interference is important. Are negative contributors, so these are uh, beneficial. Uh, these are detrimental. Eotaxin is important, CXCL1 and so on. Uh, about five of these make the bulk of the prediction. Everything else don't seem to be important. And now look at IL-6. Don't measure IL-6 if you're trying to um, find uh, uh, systemic chronic inflammation <laughs> biomarkers. So IL-6 is not contributing. TNF-alpha is not contributing. Uh, IL-1-beta, yes, a little bit, uh, but we have now better markers. Um, we went ahead and did a whole bunch of different studies to demonstrate that CXCL9 is important. Um, and we look at uh, cellular aging and cellular uh, senescence phenotypes. And we can simply recover completely the function of these endothelial cells that are aging in vitro by knocking down just 
one single gene. So inflammatory age goes down dramatically. All the interferon gamma response pathways are corrected, uh, which you, you can see here, we're upregulated in these aging cells in vitro, and we can also correct uh, different proliferation phenotypes and so on and so forth. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, uh, go into the detail, just gonna skip through. We also have a different um, approach to brain aging. So uh, this is uh, very obvious probably for you, but I, I wanted to stress that there's a tremendous variability. And I, and I love to see these plots because this variation is what's giving us the substance to be able to understand uh, biology. Uh, otherwise, we couldn't. Um, so people with uh, uh, increasing age show generally a decrease in their gray matter volume um, but there's a variation. So you can see that uh, individuals at the age of 50, 60, 70, and even 80 can be protected, while some others are declining much faster. And this is a longitudinal study, and we're building a whole bunch of different uh, metrics to predict these as, as slopes and, and be able to understand how that plays a role in um, brain aging in general and cognition. Uh, a result of, of, of that study is a cytokine clock that we derive using um, these different biomarkers, and you can see that there's a residual, uh, this is the p-value 0.02, a predicting decline in gray matter volume using this new metric for um, aging, uh, brain aging. Now we can also uh, look at other measurements, like for example, HOMA-AR, uh, very important, we can predict HOMA AR, we can predict who's going to die from, um, from, from different uh, pathologies during the study, and these are positive uh, regression coefficients using the cytokine clock, and, and you can also predict decline in um, fluency, executive uh, factors, all these are uh, brain um, aging phenotypes, that are that are uh, functional. So we're we're talking about cognitive tests that have been done in this population. So we not only can uh, predict um, structure of the brain and how that uh, shrinks and or or sometimes increase depending on the region of the brain, but also cognition. Uh, another application of our technology is in the COVID space. We took a large survey of COVID patients, about 150 or so. We now have 800 patients uh, that have been recruited in our clinic with Stanford. We're looking at 5,000 proteins. Now we're looking at 7,000 proteins, the new somalogic panel. And, and you can see from this picture B here is the number of proteins that are significantly upregulated in mild versus moderate versus severe is something I have personally never seen before. 62% of the proteome is upregulated in severe uh, uh, COVID. And those, those are, they are shown, they're shown here. Uh, very interesting findings. Uh, we have a whole story there and, and even interventions to bring those uh, phenotypes back to a healthy state. Um, the age of these different um, groups did not differ too much except for the severe ones, but the aging score which is a metric that we built using a 2019 paper that was published by uh, Tony Wiskare at Stanford, uh, looking at the same platform over thousands of individuals, you can see that the proteome aging score is actually very different in a mild from moderate from severe, and we have a number of interventions. I'm not gonna go through that because I don't have uh, enough um, time, um, to cover that part, but I'll be happy to talk about that in the Q and A's. Um, another interesting uh, result was looking at lifestyle changes. I cannot disclose too much here because it's a collaboration with uh, with industry partners. But you can see that um, we can take e selecting, which is one of the measurements, but you also can uh, clearly see that many others are um, uh, correlated with a decrease in uh, hemoglobin A1C in HOMA-AR and weight change. So this is hemoglobin A1C uh, one year after this lifetime intervention compared to uh, day zero, 
and you can um, see from this slide that we can uh, basically the ratio between e-selecting levels uh, one year after this uh, study began is positively correlated with the changes in A1C. With that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, many people and many uh, different institutions that have been in, in, engaged um, with, with this uh, research, and I would like to open the discussion for questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Furman. I am going to, um, we're going to do something a little bit different here. I'm actually going to unmute everyone. And then if you have a question, um, you can go to participants and hover over your name and uh, raise your hand to make things e easier so we're not talking over each everyone. So let me unmute everyone. You have the ability now to unmute, so you may un unmute your phone as you see fit. Great, Michelle, thank you. Thank you, Dave. This is wonderful, incredible, uh, thought-provoking uh, um, um, talk here. And just a question I was curious, because you mentioned a lot about COVID. We're working with COVID right now, patients in our long haulers COVID clinic, and we're doing um, a functional medicine SMA. And um, a lot of the patients are coming in, and we're seeing such varied responses to um, COVID themselves. And Based on a lot of your theory with inflammation and whatnot, and especially, in, for example, with CMV, are you seeing any kind of correlation with the varied response based on prior viruses? Because there was been talk about EBV also, and could this account for some of the variation? Um. Yeah, it's too early to tell. Um, the CM, the, we have a very scanned panel which is looking at an unbiased approach to different uh, viral uh, entities: EBV, HHCV, HH, uh, HHV2, uh, CMV, and many other viruses. But we don't have the data yet to um, to share with you. I apologize for that. What we can say though is that we have been identified. Uh, identifying different classes within the mild, moderate, and severe based on their proteome phenotypes. So a uh, severe A and B, a mild A, B, C, and these different classes or subclasses can now be targeted by using our AI approach to interventions. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, uh, the number one is resveratrol, believe it or not. <laughs> I think we're using that one. Huh? <laughs> I, I do have a follow up question to that. Um, you know, how does the idea around cumulative insults on the immune system play into what we're seeing with COVID? And are you looking at other um, other uh, predispositions, whether they're breastfed, bottle fed, things of that nature, um, over the course of their life? You know, a similar similar lifestyle related issues, uh, non heritable, if you will, factors. How does that play into uh, what we're seeing with COVID? Um, so the, the literature is a little conflicting, I, will, I would say. Uh, in our hands, we looked at uh, 3 million uh, users from the COVID tracker app. We published this a couple of weeks ago, and 11,000 of those 3 million got infected, and 500 or so ended up at the hospital. And we have the lifestyle, nutrition, comorbidities, and so on and so forth uh, for and symptoms followed uh, over over uh, the course of uh, a couple of months before they got infected before uh, sorry, before they they went into the hospital so we can now predict who's going to go into the hospital um to seek for more uh, uh urgent care uh based on very few uh factors including uh fever that's number one. Uh, obviously, shortness of breath. That's something we've also seen there. Um, but you know, to our surprise, taking immunosuppressants was a biggie, very, very big contributor. Um, we cannot disentangle the effect of the immunosuppressant from the effect of the autoimmune condition that underlies, you know, that that uh, immunosuppressant medication. Uh, 
But there is some studies, very recent studies, even after we published that, that have demonstrated that people with autoimmune disease may be more prone to severe disease. Um, so we didn't really uh, see very many features coming up. BMI was selected, but it's not a very big contributor. Uh, we also see that in the clinic, some people showing up with relatively normal BMI, but having a very severe uh, course of disease. So there's something that's going on beyond uh, what, what we understand as uh, risk factors for for COVID severity, and that has to do with the internal proteome. Um, now, obviously, it, it, there's there's more and more data showing that uh, people with uh, pre-existing conditions are more at risk, and that's very clear that no one can can deny that. Um, but in terms of the exposome and the different lifestyle uh, effects, I would say uh, it's more so the comorbidity than the lifestyle itself, which, which is circular because, you know, lifestyle leads to comorbidity. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers at least partially your question. So can I shut out here? Is Am I on? Yes. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, uh, David, that was a fabulous uh, talk, and I, uh, I, I was going to say that uh, I was supposed to meet you at a at a, uh, a meeting at the University of Colorado last March, which was probably the the first meeting that it was canceled on my agenda, and uh, uh, so we never. And, they, and they've never got it back together again. So some somewhere down the line, I recommended you for the conference. I was on the steering committee. So a year okay. later, here, hello. <laughs> Thank you. So let me let me ask you. So I, I you know, we're, we're everybody's COVID. We're 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 we're, we're immersed in it. So it's interesting, and, and it, it's not surprising to me that that you're. Uh, um, your your model uh, would be separate mild from moderate to severe COVID. The question uh, would, would uh, two one, and I'm sure you're examining this now. What is, what is the the regression of of that perturbation over time as people get better? There's been some deep immune profiling um, that shows persistent T cell dysregulation, at least phenotypically, you know, 30, 60, 90 days later. Um, any 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 insights? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so we have now one year worth of data um, and we've been analyzing the data for the past six months. So people that are six months out um, uh, their their initial um, infectious uh, burden, and they have still a clear aging phenotype. So those aging scores that I was showing you in the severe, in, in more mild and, and severe, those persist over six months after the fact. Yeah, um, I am not surprised. It's well, it, well, it, sure, it's not surprising, but it's major, right? Because this is. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's driving, it's pushing your immune system to an older phenotype. Um, so what it, are the- It relates with the mortality data, delayed mortality from other, from non-COVID causes. That's absolutely right. And what we believe is, you know, the more uh, the, the more the aging score, the higher the aging score, as you're saying, the closer to um, other morbidities and mortality in the end. So I think it's uh, not just cytokine storm, obviously, um, because this lasts for a longer period of time, and ha but has consequences in uh, more chronic conditions, um, other than just you know uh, cytokine storm being the major cause of disease. I think we know now uh, that there are other um, you know aspects of, of of COVID, especially in long haulers, that are driving uh, mortality for other causes. You know, let me ask you a follow up. You made an interesting comment about autoimmune and morbidity. That, that's my space, and and we're involved in several registries. And 
I, I think you're absolutely right that there are there are, there are data that a variety of autoimmune diseases uh, may increase morbidity and mortality, and then teasing this out from the therapy is where it's getting more complicated. We know that glucocorticoids are bad, and th that's across IBD, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, psoriasis. But when we talk about, uh, th and this is interesting, and, and I, this is what I'm asking, uh, when we look at people, and there are not that many right now, who are on monotherapy with like anti-cytokine therapies, particularly like anti-IL-6 or anti-TNF at baseline, not on methotrexate, anti-metabolites, not on glucocorticoids, they actually appear to do not too bad. And actually, there's some left shifting on forest plots that are intriguing. Yeah, would you be... Surprised? Um, I think it's the distinction between a targeted approach and a more untargeted approach. So when you target, uh, you know, hubs like TNF, um, you're going to be um, using that network of cytokines that are around TNF alpha that are affected by TNF alpha in a gene expression and on, on protein space. Um, only, whereas if you do glucocorticoids, it's much broader, right? Uh, so, so it's. I, I think I'm not surprised that the targeted approaches will have maybe even a little bit of benefit, um, and and not so many, you know, uh, side or long-term side consequences, uh, as opposed to a more, you know, untargeted, uh, very unspecific approach like using corticoids. Um, a, a medication. That that's that's my my take on that. I don't have more specifics on that. I was just say, if you're affecting a single node, it's probably um, you know safer. 